ओके वेलकम बैक द नेक्स्ट स्पीकर इज शांतला हेगडे शी इज एन एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर एंड कंसल्टेंट इन क्लिनिकल न्यूरो साइकोलॉजी एट निम हैंस सो शी इज डन हर एम फिल एंड पी एच डी इन क्लिनिकल न्यूरो साइकोलॉजी वे शी स्पेशलाइज इन स्कीजोफ्रीनिया बट शी इज अ ट्रेंड हिंदुस्तानी वोकलिस्ट सो शी इज ऑलवेज बिन इंटरेस्टेड इन म्यूजिक and she was always trying to find an angle to work on music although you know she's published a lot and did a lot of work on understanding schizophrenia but after her phd she sort of combined both these interests and uh, she's also so she did an internship with the international brain music and sounds laboratory at mcgill where she looked at areas of music emotion music and language rhythm perception and she's also a trained neurological music therapist and she's an affiliate member of the academy of neurological music therapy so she does a lot of work in understanding how um, our brain changes because of music and she also wants to uh, use music as a diagnostic tool and also a restorative tool for mental illnesses so let's hear from her now thanks uh, leslie thanks to the cognitive science team for inni- inviting me to this program and i i think the coffee break was good because uh, the previous two talks were just amazing mind boggling but i think a break kind of gave you a fresh perspective on a different different note so to say um yes how uh, argyman just mentioned about uh, you know visual art in science and how visualization kind of benefits in understanding science uh, as neuropsychologist i think it's so important when you give multi sensory information for our cells to learn something not always in textual form and i think one of the most powerful uh, phenomena or technique has been the auditory domain you know we listen to rhymes when we were kids we listen we learn through rhymes we learn concepts through songs and that kind of stays till the end and we have seen patients with dementia degenerative conditions uh, who forget so many things that they have learned over time but never forget something that they would have learned at their early age and especially through musical forms so music in that sense is very powerful universal behavior in today's talk uh, this is not working okay okay so i'm just going to uh, since i was told that it's going to be a mixed group uh, how many of you are trained in music i know he is <laughs> and i know okay quite a few and how many of you listen to music you don't listen to music or oh, hesitate but as you can see uh, listening to music indulging in music is a universal behavior uh, we kind of take it more as a cultural socio cultural uh, view point on it and also as a form of entertainment but not really as a human behavior if something is so universal there should be something important uh, for it to be there amit says and uh, we all know we listen to music for various reason so if i ask a few of you why do you listen to music all of you listened all of you raised except a few hesitating we raised why do you listen to music what's the most important thing that relaxation yeah and then it energizes yes refresh refreshing yeah and then refreshing helps in concentration okay kills boredom helps in regulating our mood sometimes makes me feel sad which i want to be sad helps me express things so we all know what music does to us kind of we take it for granted yet not really question it from a you know science point of view so i'll kind of dwell upon that perspective and uh, my favorite uh, topic and i think that's where music kind of contributes so much to neuroscience and its research in terms of neural plasticity and it's i take this opportunity because there are many youngsters here who would want to know the difference between therapy and something being therapeutic um i'll come uh, i'll talk about that and need for evidence based research in this field there are challenges 
there are reasons why music research did not happen in the fast speed as other subjects within the field of neuroscience did. Uh, but yes, it's catching up in a big time right now. So what is music? If I ask this question, many of you will tell me what it really does. But then what is music from physics point of view? It's, you know, a sound organized in terms of time. But we also know that just a beep, beep, beep sound or a metronome sound or just a tapping sound after a while will not sound like musical to us. We do differentiate between noise and music. And without our knowledge, we also do know there are hierarchical steps in music. So there is grammar in it. There is organization of pitch, tone. So in that sense, music and language have some amount of hierarchy in its components. And they're hierarchically placed in the sense you have rhythm, you have meter. Similarly, you have different tones. Then you have pitches and their intervals. And then you may call the relationship between these notes, right? And then meaning to it. So there is a grammar to whole music. So whether we explicitly know about it, but still all of us comprehend music, without which you wouldn't have indulged in music for whatever reasons that you are doing, right? So it does kind of uh, compete with language in that sense. Um, yes, we use it to express uh, emotion. It's one of the most powerful tool uh, that we use to express emotion and experience emotion. There's also universality in that sense, like language. Um, there is dialects that vary, there are different forms of music, but nevertheless, there are certain components that are universal. You have equidistance like sa, pa, ta, which you know are uh, fixed notations, and then you have the microtones. In Indian classical music, we'll say, even further on, we say uh, 22 shrutis, not just the microtones, like between sa, re, ga, ma, pa, da, ni, sa, you still have sa, re, re, ga, ga, Mama. So you go on with, you know, microtones and they'll say, oh, this ray is not the darbari ray and this ga is not this ga and things like that. Um, moderate number of pitches, stable points, similar to uh, lullabies. So lullabies again are universal uh, where you have high pitch tones, low rhythm, you know, your mother trying to soothe the baby and so there's certain universal components. Now, so another key point when you're talking about universality is it. It, it, is, it does have some biological uh, phenomena perhaps. It has some biological basis to it and not just mere entertainment. So there are archeological evidences now which says music has been with humans, even predating like the modern humans, uh, fossils of uh, bird bones. But the interesting thing is you have equidistance. So it's not like randomly made instrument. So it was purposefully made out of bird bones which is excavated from caves in Germany. If you go back to Indian history, um, there is of course debate, but the origins of Indian classical music is either dated to Vedas, where the Vedic texts, the, uh, you know, the mantras, where the Udatta, Anudatta and Swarita, three tones were there. By the time it came to the Vedic period of Sama Veda, you had five tones and then seven tones. So many musicians and music theorists say that Samaveda was the origins for Indian classical music. There are other perspectives also saying that um, it emerged from folk music. But if you really go in, what do you mean by folk? It's something that humans engaged in. Perhaps Vedic texts in that sense also is kind of a folk form. Nevertheless, the debate can go on and on. But the interesting thing is, uh, of course, your vocal tracts cannot fossilize, but we do have larger thoracic canal compared to other species and uh, I'm not, uh, you know, zoologist or talking about too much from the anthropological point of view, but from a neurocognitive point of view, neuropsychological point of view, if a behavior has been with us for such long period and has been passed on from one to another, from an evolutionary perspective, it means that it has a significant role to play in, in some form. So when we talk about any behavior, it has to have some adaptability component, which helps us survive, which helps us you know, uh, keep on, uh, keep our offsprings going. Uh, why is it important? Because Darwin, the person who talked so much about evolutionary theory, in his books initially said it's just uh, sort of behavioral fossil. 
which kind of predates language, it kind of helped the language formation, but it really does not have any adaptable role to play, adaptability. It's not adding any skill set uh, in that sense. So that behavior is like a fossil. And uh, in fact, Steven Pinker, uh, the cognitive scientist in his book, How Mind Works, did rake up this back and said, uh, it's like an auditory cheesecake. It really does not have a role to play. It's just nearly there. It kind of triggers sometimes our uh, you know, language skill set. It's kind of like a spandrel. So yeah, in science, we need critics. You know, give a different perspective to what it's there. And it's a universal belief. If you ask anybody, they'll say, yes, music is important, whether uh, they look at it from the science perspective or not. But the question is, so definitely didn't seem to answer a lot of questions. So later, of course, Charles Darwin himself changed. So good scientists do contradict themselves and accept when they are wrong. He said in his last life that if I had my life to live over again, I would have made a rule to read some poetry and listen to some music at least once a week. So kind of regretted at later time. But the question is, there are several theories put forth uh, as to why music is existing in our life. So is it just for mere language, that language formation happened, music was kind of predating that, and then it's kind of, kind of being there, really not playing an important role. But the question is then, why are humans still engaging in production of music? In fact, uh, according to some statistics, illegal downloading for pornography is second, first comes music. Um, so music is addictive in that sense, you know. So the other set of theories were, is it because of sexual selection, you know, like in uh, animal species where birds sing, the males generally dominate in their artistic skills to impress the female counterpart. But in humans, that again, the theory fails. You have good singers who are female, they're not really males also. And uh, anyway, these are different perspective. Uh, neuroscience and music uh, has actually been contributed by multidisciplinary team. So I am looking at it from one window, but um, ethnomusicologists, musicologists, anthropologists, all have contributed to this understanding. So this question of, if you ask language, there's a lot of work happening in the field of uh, neuromusicology, looking at language and music, and looking at how uh, is it unique or is it that we have shared neural substrates between music and language in the brain? Are there uh, unique areas itself? Because when you talk about from a neuropsychological perspective, you're talking about localization, localizing the behavior and the corresponding brain area. Um, it also has implications in the therapy part, which I'll come a bit later. But when you ask what is music, they'll say it's like a language. It uh, uh, it kind of helps us communicate uh, far better. I'll just take you through a small experiment and then take it further. I want all of you to listen to this carefully, uh, whatever auditory information that you're going to hear, okay? I can play it twice if you have not heard it. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. Heard that? I'm going to play that once more, just to make sure that you've heard it. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. Heard that? Now I'm going to play one more. I want you to listen to that carefully as well. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. But they sometimes behave so strangely, they sometimes behave so strangely, 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 Sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. So strangely. So strangely. So strangely. So strangely. Okay, I'm going to play the one that I played 
first, and I want you to listen to it now. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. I didn't change anything. And uh, yeah, yeah. You want me to play that again? <laughs> okay. So what actually is happening is this already inherent musical quality in language. So it's just that, you know, repetition of that highlights the prosody in it. And it's just a simple example of, you know, immediate neural plasticity as well. How you kind of process the same information differently. And having repeated that, your attention has actually focused on the prosody part of it and sound starts sounding like music. So which many of our current music also does that, you know, you kind of wrap it, you repeat it and then it starts sounding uh, like, so this is not my work. Uh, you know, it's amazing. I mean, it's such an interesting experiment, which was done by Diana Dodge, uh, who worked in uh, the area of music and illusions. So we do know about illusions uh, in the visual art, but this is some of her work are just pioneering and uh, mind boggling in terms of auditory illusions. And what she did was actually she came across this while recording for her book on phantoms of illusions, of auditory illusions. And while recording for that CD, she, you know, you edit the CD, right? She came across and I said, this is some phenomena that I have to study further. Now what they did was to take this experiment further, took a group of students and played this repetition to one set of group and just once, just like how you heard it for the first time to another group. So you'll be amazed. You yourself will know which group heard the repetition and which group did not hear the repetition. So it's like the the uh, average of like all or combin you know combination of all the uh, uh, responses given by students. Sometimes it is so strangely the one group that heard the repetition, and sometimes it is so strangely. So it was a group that did not hear the repetition. So it kind of highlights that this debate on music and language will go on and on. But what at the present time that neuroscientists have understood is that let it, you know, it's like chicken, the uh, egg kind of hen and egg uh, puzzle, which came first, doesn't matter. But at least we know that um, with advancement in technology now with fMRI, EEG, behavioral studies and all that, that yes, there is shared neural substrates for language and music and unique areas as well. But the, the repetition, like this repetition, highlighting the component, which is far more used in music can actually be used subsequently for language rehabilitation or language acquisition, uh, be it in clinical condition or in normal humans. So taking it forward, uh, so yeah, so this is the uh, book and the work by Diana Dosh. The sounds as they appear the sounds to you as they appear are not only different from those that are sometimes. That was strange indeed. So, yeah, so the other uh, theories that have been put forth again is social cohesion. Is it that music kind of was a part of group kind of behavior that people got together, think of cavemen and, you know, survival of the fittest was when you could survive together. Uh, but we do know that musical behavior, musical indulgence can also be a solitary pursuit. You want to just listen to it alone and need not always be in a group. But today there are uh, research studies that have put forth to understand the positive effect of doing music together. We do know that when we get together and play music, there's automatically a lot of social cognitive processes that are happening. There's also oxytocin that's released, empathy that we talk about, you know, with group bonding that occurs. So even in neuro rehabilitation now, especially in, you know, uh, different clinical conditions, more so in elderly where group sessions are uh, preferred over, you know, one-to-one -one sessions because of many of these reasons. Of course, it cannot answer all the reasons why music has been with us for so many years, but the other one is whether it's mother-child bonding. So music emerged with, you know, mother singing to the baby like lullabies. And we do know babies who are, uh, you know, sung to or cared, you know, with music have more survival uh, uh, value than the others. But 
Today we know that music does play an important role in child development, neurocognitive development and what not in terms of the neurophysiological changes. But definitely music is all cut across lifespan. It's just not in child mother bonding, but it could occur at different uh, stages of our life cycle. So why is then music still there is the fact that what we know now, this particular brain that is about one point you know, uh, four kgs uh, is still an enigma in terms of many of its functions. What we are trying to understand is, okay, what happens when there is a damage to a given area and how we could improve the functions and how we could help the person rehabilitate and come to near normal functioning, if not back to their normal functioning, is that music uh, in terms of its development engages almost all known cognitive processes. Another key thing in terms of brain development itself is the concept of pruning that happens. We are born with more number of neurons and as we come to the adolescent age, we, pruning does happen, which means you, whatever stimulation that we would have given, multi-sensory stimulation that we would have given will hold on and then there is reduction of the neuron cells that happen. Why is this important? So psychologists do stress a lot on multi-sensory stimulation, enriched environment for the child during development, especially up till the adolescent age because this multi-sensory stimulation actually plays an important role in cognitive reserve that we talk about when there is damage that happens. So many a times when we see patients, the pre-morbid level of functioning plays a very crucial role for our understanding of how much intervention could have an impact in recovery or how much uh, the person still has as you know functions, cognitive functions, despite the damage that has occurred. Damage could be through various conditions, neurological, neurosurgical conditions. So what determines this kind of development? Of course, we do know genetics plays a role, environment and experience plays a very important role. The crucial thing is, the concept of neural plasticity. That is, uh, how much does the brain changes its structural functional aspects due to the experiences that we have in our life. So music, of course, I can go on talking about music, 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 but frankly speaking, as a researcher and a scientist, we, we do know one side of the story. Of course, I always say that music is an enriched kind of uh, activity, but we still haven't compared with other forms of uh, skillful, focused skillful activity like say drawing or visual art or performing art and then see how much are we talking about in terms of neural plasticity. Uh, music definitely helps in terms of giving this enriched environment because it engages almost all cognitive processes. Uh, in terms of uh, neuropsychological perspective, you're talking about frontal area functions, executive function, planning, because it's sound unfolding in time, you have to keep up with the time, the rhythm, uh, and also emotion, the lyrics, so you have, and motor entrainment. So if I start teaching a child, or you start learning music, or you listen to good music, you're tapping to the rhythm or engaging with the rhythm. Uh, so there is, subcortical area, cortical area, uh, the limbic system, whatever that you talk about in terms of brain functions is activated when you are indulging in music. More so actively and definitely passively also. So if you talk about from neural plasticity, therefore music um, does play an important role. The reason being, we do know now from uh, various uh, perspective studies that have been done that it uh, brings about changes in your hormonal level, brings out changes in your neurotransmitters, brings changes in the functional as I said because of engaging in music and listening, the functional and structural changes that occurs. So uh, there was period when people thought that brain will never change after a certain age. Neurogenesis will not happen after this age and then, you know, it's kind of a downhill kind of uh, process that after 30 you're going to really going to lose your cognitive functions. But now what we understand is neurogenesis can happen at any age. Even in your deathbed you could learn something new. So neurogenesis, hippocampal, dendrite gyri can activate new cells and, you know, stem cells getting into activating this neural plasticity in other terms. Uh, so there's nothing like, you know, we end learning at this age. Of course, there are differences between skills that are learned at a younger age 
we do know here is a music teacher would say perhaps if you start learning at a younger age your agility would be much higher than you know you, know, you perhaps have to put a lot more effort as uh, the age goes on so at least the myth has gone that uh, you cannot you know brain is kind of a static it never changes so in that sense music one is ubiquitous it is biologically based as we know now and it has definitely unique as well as shared neural substrates uh, with other cognitive process especially language as i mentioned and uh, definitely a highly demanding task if you have to learn music uh, some of you have learned music and you would know um, that it engages almost all cognitive functions so robert zetter in his paper has mentioned neuroscience uh, for neuroscientists music is definitely a food um, that's his title of the paper the reason being uh, music research in music has contributed a lot to the understanding of human brain so uh, one is from a music therapy point of view but this i'm talking out from the basic cognitive science perspective itself for a long time language kind of took the precedence quite understandable because if you have a person who loses uh, ability to speak after let's say stroke or uh, head injury that actually limits his uh, functionality in terms of getting back to work occupational functioning so on and so forth but uh, music wouldn't matter really right uh, until unless that person is a musician trained musician and it starts affecting that i'm not able to perform that's one thing second was technology also was not that uh, sharp like in the sense uh, we didn't have a real time acquisition of knowledge, you know information to know how is music being processed how is language being processed so on and so forth so the last three decades lot of work has been done this is one of the perhaps vibrant um, field in the area of cognitive neuroscience neuromusicology and um, uh, it's perhaps a lot of work done from western perspective western music on western population and not so much from the indian music and indian uh, uh, indian population so it definitely is uh, uh, you know an important question to ask so is it difference between musicians and non musicians so trying to understand effect of music on the human brain the functionality of human brain one is you take different methods like you either take cross sectional study or a longitudinal study or in the sense cross sectional would be to compare musicians and non musicians of course the inherent challenge in that is how are you controlling for other variables that could have played a role so is there a you know family history of musical training or has there an edge over that when people come from musical family versus not or things like that but we do know uh, over the years that uh, there are certain areas sensory motor area the plenum temporal auditory processing also corpus callosum which actually in, you know links cross information from the either the two hemispheres are different and thickened or larger in musicians than non musicians the next question would be would uh, you know uh, instrument matter yes so you do have studies done on uh, pianists where you know who have started learning less than 7 years of age having thicker corpus callosum compared to the non musicians and uh, difference between pianists versus violinists because of the way in which they use their fingers and the instruments and so there is definitely skill based representation changes that you would observe in the functionality and the structures of the human brain But if you look at this this is like the cartoon that i could make uh, in terms of uh, what are all the different cognitive process that gets engaged when you are talking about music behavior musical uh, so you have auditory processing auditory imagery a um, lot of executive functioning uh, imagery in terms of both verbal and visual uh, motor coordination emotion and, and so on and so forth so in that sense music is not just for food for cognitive neuroscience but also the best gym that you can think for cognitive remediation cognitive rehabilitation which i'll uh, come to the in just a while so what do we know so far uh, in the field of neuromusicology this was published in lancet by uh, teppo sarakamo the team who have worked a lot in stroke rehabilitation 
that yes, music engages almost different networks. Now we talk about network and not just localization, lateralization. So it does bring about the auditory pathway, not surprising because auditory processing is involved, but also syntactic network in, in terms of uh, grammar, language kind of processing, attention and working memory, the prefrontal, uh, the basal ganglia network, the motor network and the reward and the emotion. So a lot of work done with uh, dopamine, uh, uh, you know, secretion with musical engagement, goosebump phenomena, you know, have this goosebumps when your favorite music is played or certain part of the music that brings about these uh, uh, hair rising kind of feelings. So the other uh, myth is that right left hemisphere that oh, you're artistic, you're more uh, right hemisphere dominant and you're more language or science, maths and it's left based, we, that myth is no more true you have almost the entire right left hemisphere being involved when you're talking about uh, music and so with language we do know now that there is dominance of course for language being left and non-language skills being right like prosody being right uh, word processing more in the left uh, rhythm for example has a lot left representation meter uh, and musicians themselves start after intense training after many years start processing it more like language than uh, so-called music with novice people. So in that sense, uh, music is considered the best gym for uh, cognitive uh, retraining, cognitive remediation. Another important thing, many of you may be from biology background or may remember this auditory pathway. So from the midbrain, the cochlea and the midbrain, inferior colloquially, you have tonotopic representation of the sound. So just like retinotopic representation, different frequencies are represented um, uh, with different hair, cell, hair follicles uh, vibrating to the sounds. And that's true when in, until we reach the Heschel's gyri and you know, high pitch frequencies process more in, in the medial structure, medial area of the Heschel's gyri and low pitch sounds being processed more in the lateral surface. The question of course have been, do music really uh, uh, evoke the real life emotion or is it not really so? So this is another critical uh, question that has been asked. Do musical emotion are real emotions and why is it still there? So another important thing is, as I said, it's like a cognitive gym. Uh, some theories have put forth that uh, musical emotions do engage the very same, activate the same limbic area and the uh, prefrontal ventromedial area that we know in the real situation. But uh, the, the contrast is that sad music is preferred uh, and many people do like sad music. So now people are looking at why do people like sad music and studies what has been done shows that perhaps the ones who like the sad music have high level of empathy and it's also like a mental preparation david huron keeps telling me this that it's like a mentally you're preparing for the real life situation in some sense so your visual imagery and you know you the sadness in music is not preferred otherwise in real life but it kind of gives you a already that you're prepared and geared up to face it in real life. So again, it's a mental gym in that sense, so which prepares you for that. So musical predispositions, we do know that uh, it predates and even babies and young infants do respond to consonant and dissonant music. They are sensitive to musical scales, temporal regularity, um, uh, looking at, uh, you know, how uh, they prefer consonant chord or a dissonant chord or uh, when you play a wrong note, how much do they say, okay, this is not right or not wrong by the time they are five to six year old. In our own study, what we saw was, uh, we took Hindustani classical. I'm trained in Hindustani classical, so my first preference was that. My key interest was like ragas and the rasa, the emotions, right? So um, somehow I was not co convinced about the fact that um, you listen to this raga and this, this is the effect, you know, this is how Many music therapists will talk. You listen to this raga for this problem. You listen to this raga for that problem. But inherently, we know that the musical features, musical structure does play a very important role when we are talking about uh, emotional experiences, right? It's same as in language. When I'm very sad and I will not say, come, let's go for a movie. I, I would be happy and say, come, let's go for a movie. O automatically, your pitch goes high. Your emotion does represent that variation. 
same thing with music the speed the pitch density how many notes come in that all that actually determines the emotional processing so what we did was to begin with keep it quite simple we took the ala portion uh, ala is the initial phase of raga elaboration in indian classical music it has different phases okay uh, in phase 2 in instrumental music especially the tabla or the, any percussion instrument wouldn't have uh, taken its entry it will be pulsated though the alap is like uh, um, metric free there's no rhythm there is it perhaps is so uh, large that you cannot keep a pulse as well um, and then comes the composition part where you actually have a set composition to a given rhythm and you know we call it as the gat or the uh, drit portion and then goes on so to begin with to keep it simple this is another challenge uh, whom do you consider as an you can't take like multiple artists performing the same rag it can vary the artist interpretation can bring about an inherent variation so it took one artist one instrument i took flute to begin with because the bansuri is closest to the pure tone does not have too many over tones compared to other forms of instrument so we took uh, alap and the george ala portion played it to children of 5 to 6 year old and 10 to 11 our expectation was would the george ala portion change the experience of the emotion often it does in the older adults as we have seen but with 5 to 6 year old that change in tempo didn't really matter but they could clearly say that okay this was happy this was sad um, they could not come out with what rasa indian music theory rasa would talk about but by the time they were 10 to 11 year old they could bring about more than one emotion or they would relate it like in kids they would say uh, i'm they wouldn't say i'm feel this is sad but they would say it's like you know i have lost my pencil in my class and then i have to go back home or uh, chota beam or some you know like krishna and some character and so they would often project it to another character to express their emotion rather than like adult saying yeah this is happy or this is sad or bring about more than one emotion which often is true in indian music okay i'll quickly run through i think uh, <laughs> hmm? okay i'll just uh, quickly take you through the work we are doing so this is work which we did on non musicians music people who have not been trained um, and what we looked at was that the difference between the ragas in the ala portion was much smaller compared to the difference within the raga from ala to george ala interesting right so if i play uh, rag marwa and todi and something all which comes under almost the same with minor notes and i play the ala portion for an untrained ear almost it might seem the same but from the ala portion of that given raga to the george ala the emotional experience changes the violence changes and the arousability changes so it's interesting because the lo lot more work needs to be done in indian classical music and the biggest challenge for researchers in music cognition is that you're not taking ecologically valid music right sometimes we take only a short portion of musical excerpt or just a feature of the musical excerpt or rhythm and then check okay cognitive processing and things like that so the whole debate is okay then how do you choose your uh, generalizability is the biggest question so i can only say okay i took these sets of excerpts based on this theory this is what i found and um, anyway this is more from the basic uh, cognitive uh, uh, perspective the thing is that indian musicians of course have the freedom it's like jazz music not as much as western classical but hindustani more so has has a lot of uh, comparison between jazz musicians where you do have a rough framework of the rules and regulations of that thing and you you have the freedom to move around and bring about this multiple rasas that we talk about so the freedom is with the artist should i bring more uh, uh, devotion kind of emotion or should i bring more longing so you talk to musician they'll say rag yaman i can bring this i can bring the happy version i can bring the sad version i can so it is this framework that we have but definitely you can't make rag todi or marwa being very happy uh, for the untrained ears as you increase the speed it will see more of negative balanced and high arousability so when i played this to a french group of listeners they were they were like okay this is angry this is none of our indian musicians would kind of perceive anger whereas the uh, so there is cultural difference cross cultural difference so we need to do that kind of research also definitely is uh, lucky the biggest question for me I, I, from being in a clinical setup so i'm a clinic, clinician and researcher i'm not 
full time into basic research. I don't have that luxury. The biggest question would be having understood or gathered this knowledge from uh, from researchers across. How are, how am I going to use this in you know helping people who are definitely in need? So one question is musicians being different than non musicians. Yes, it's very important for us to understand the functioning of the human brain, the structure, the functions, blah 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 blah. But how is this information going to help? Does it have just near, near transfer that we call that musically trained individuals, these benefits are there. In fact, there's a recent paper 2019 uh, published, which is kind of really going to be making a uh, huge critical perspective on music cognition research, saying that uh, musical training really does not have an impact on cognitive processes. And it's just cross-sectional studies that are being done. And my, my doubt is, you know, it could be, it is from published from the political science department. So is it like uh, in UK policies because they have want to cut down on the uh, government school music education. So this whole, so there could be different angles to it. Nevertheless, the, the question is, so what about far transfer? Not just in musical skills or is there far transfer on spatial, verbal, mathematical performance and language skills? At one time in the field of neuromusicology, the, um, in the field of music, I would say, there was this famous thing about Mozart effect. Even now people will ask me Mozart effect. It was actually popularized by commercial ventures to sell their CDs and the mothers were fooled to say that, oh, you listen to Mozart, your baby will have this plus IQ score and all that. But what we know today is it need not be Mozart. It can be any music, but can have positive benefits and positive effect. The question now is how much does it transfer to other functions, not in the musical domain, non-musical domain of functioning, and how long can it sustain this effect and generalizability of that into the real life situation. So some studies now, Psyche Louis in uh, Western, Northwestern University has done this work on looking at uh, children who have had training in music and comparing them with who have, uh, uh, you know, uh, training in physical exercise and uh, what is their overall uh, uh, structural changes in, in the prefrontal network and all that, but also looking at uh, cognitive function. So how much hours of musical practice does have beneficial effect in you know, uh, IQ and other processes. So in that sense, music as an age old art form has been known yeah, and across culture. The question, as I said, has been with how do we transfer this information in a therapeutic setting? The first thing we need to clarify is that there's difference between when I say something is therapeutic and when I say music has to be used as therapy. Uh, good food, uh, going into the nature, you know, feeling relaxed, definitely is therapeutic. Listening to music can be therapeutic. But when I say therapy, it's like, you know, you're going to a dietitian and you, if someone says eat good food, it's like something is therapeutic. But when you say I have vitamin deficiency, you'll undergo some tests, right, to know exactly what is the problem and then to prescribe that. So you need to have proper training when you want to talk about therapy. So if you, so that, that's the key thing that uh, you need to have some clinical training or be able to understand if I'm seeing a patient with stroke or Parkinson's, I need to have a baseline effect of, okay, where is this uh, parameters and what is it that I need to do to help him or her uh, in benefiting this. So, so in that sense, there has been a debate of, you know, uh, music in our lives, but definitely because of its, uh, you know, rich data that we have gathered that yes, music engages almost all cognitive process and engagement. Music therapy as a field has actually borrowed this model now. So there's a whole new model that's being used is the neuroscience model, uh, neuroscientific basis to music therapy, which actually caters to three domains. And uh, from our lab, what we're trying to therefore to see is uh, to try and answer some questions about basic questions about what are these deficits that we see in various clinical conditions? We take clinical conditions as a model, like Parkinson's, we do know basal ganglia involvement is there, or substantia nigra, uh, the frontostriatal network that actually you know, impacts various cognitive functions. So we try to look at uh, how is their rhythm perception? On one hand, we do know there is rhythmic auditory stimulation as a technique in neuroscientific model of uh, music therapy. RAS is the term widely used and has shown benefits. The question is, of course, generalizability and sustenance of that improvement. 
In this study, what we looked at was uh, Parkinson's patient. Are they, do they have any deficit in rhythm perception? And rhythm, I mean at different levels. In musical context, you could have rhythm. Can they perceive rhythm uh, in musical context, in be able to differentiate between different beats, things like that. And we also carried out some of the non-musical domain of cognitive processes, like working memory, focused attention, and food. What we found was, uh, oh, I missed that slide, I think. Okay, what we found was that um, that musical deficits, rhythm perception deficit, did predict their performance on immediate memory, that is digit forward and backward and processing speed. So what we know is that even in the neurocognitive, neuropsychological testing, when we are talking about information processing, at the base of it is, you know, equidistant in information processing. If I talk suddenly very speedily and then I slow down, comprehension becomes difficult. Without our knowledge in any domain that we are talking about, there is an inherent rhythm. So what we found in this study was, yes, Parkinson's patients do perform poorly on almost all rhythm perception tests on one hand, but they do, we do know that they benefit from rhythmic auditory stimulation technique because there is an entrainment that happens. But there is also an inherent relationship between rhythm deficit and cognitive deficits, which means tomorrow we develop rhythm-based exercises. It should also impact not just their motor functions, but also other cognitive functions, which would have impact in their day-to-day -day activity and function. So our idea is not to make them musicians. The idea is to use musical components in therapy situation. The recent study that we published uh, was to look at uh, one-time listening in patients with schizophrenia. So I have been working with population of Parkinson's, stroke, now schizophrenia, a couple of work, similar work that we have done looking at uh, musical deficits, uh, emotional perception deficit and cognitive functions in schizophrenia and Parkinson's disease. To look at how much does musical deficits like contour, rhythmic perception, does correlate or how much does, do they predict the performance in the non-musical domain of cognitive functioning, like building the base, you mean, you know, in that sense, for music-based intervention for cognitive remediation. Um, in this study, what we did was to look at one-time music listening on P300. Now, P300 is like uh, a universally used marker for to uh, assess attention, also component of working memory. So 300 millisecond after a given sound, uh, whether it's not at a behavior level, but at the brain level, right? So ERP, event-related potential that we talk about. So what we found was one-time music listening we did auditory oddball paradigm prior to listening to music and then after music listening. So we did an ABAB uh, design to um, even take care of the uh, inherent presentation uh, bias. And we found that there was difference in the amplitude, there was difference in accuracy and reaction time following music listening. The theory that we put forth was in patients with schizophrenia, there's hyper arousability. So listening to pleasant music could bring down their cortical arousability, thereby facilitating attention processing. This is very important for us because this is just one time music listening. Uh, remember in India, we have patients who come from all over the place. Many cannot afford you know, coming to hospital on a daily basis. It's not like insurance company taking care. There are also patients with whom a caregiver has to come, which means extra financial burden on the family. My idea is that at least we could develop some method uh, of easily distributable kind of treatment module, which may not be foolproof, but if it can Im have impact on their cognitive processes, especially in a debilitating condition like schizophrenia, is that it can have impact on their cognitive function. Improved cognitive function is known to improve their overall functionality and also reduce relapse rate. The problem with this, it starts at adolescent and a young age. So over time, they have to you know, uh, need treatment that can reduce relapse in these conditions. So we found changes in, which was not statistically significant, but mean amplitude was much higher after uh, music listening, which means it facilitated the cognitive processing. And we looked at uh, power spectral analysis, uh, again, changes in alpha and uh, gamma activity. So some of the other work we are doing at our institute is looking at uh, music listening prior to uh, spinal surgery. Does it have any impact on uh, depth of anesthesia, anesthetic drug dosage? Because 
drugs itself can have impact on cognitive functioning, negative impact on cognitive functioning. So some studies have looked at listening to music actually uh, would require less number of anesthetic drug and thereby you could have less uh, you know, impact on the cognitive function. We did it on patients who underwent GA. So you might question that they actually did not listen to music when their surgery was happening, but we introduced music much before they went into the OT. So almost half an hour before they went into the OT. Looked at uh, cortisol level, again a very finicky uh, parameter, it will change even otherwise there is variation during the day. But the key finding we found was anxiety and uh, you know pain perception because pain in spinal surgery is very, very high. At least subjective experience of pain and anxiety was much different to the group that received music. We did a double blind RCT in this and the ones who did not receive had higher uh, impact. Um, we are also looking at developing short modules of patients with diabetes. Uh, if listening to music and music intervention, the theory again behind this is can, can target hypothalamic pituitary axis. So we do know diabetes is a lifestyle disease now. Di diabetes is also a risk factor for degenerative conditions. So people who have long-standing diabetes, uncontrolled high sugar, blood sugar level, have are at risk for degenerative conditions like dementia, Alzheimer's type. So if we could reduce this anxiety and stress could perhaps have an impact on the sh blood sugar level. So it did HPAC one. Subjectively, yes, subjects did feel that, you know, it benefited them compared to the ones who did not receive. So the whole model that I'm trying to look at is music, not just from a social science perspective. Music therapy has long, long time been practiced. Of course, in India, we do not have strict licensing program or music education, uh, therapy education from graduate, postgraduate level. And the ones that are there are quite, you know, in a sad state because of lack of structure and uh, well modeled uh, programs. But I'm seeing that there is hope. It's not like it's hopeless, but we will come to that. The challenge is, okay, what kind of music, how you're going to use and all that. But key thing is, it is definitely benefiting the neural plasticity and you know whether you're talking about it from a clinical perspective or from a, a purely basic science perspective. And um, yes, so, targeting at multiple levels of uh, cognitive functioning. So I just end here that it's definitely food for neuroscience. There is need for, you know, uh, in terms of music therapy when you're talking about, or even music research, the biggest challenge is how do you select the stimuli? How do you want to conduct the experiment? How do you go about uh, controlling for other variables that may play a very crucial role when we are talking about music, especially, uh, and then, uh, these are some of the challenges that we need to take when we talk about Indian classical music. People ask me, so are you comparing Hindustani with Karnataka? I'm like, I haven't done that. But uh, what is the point? What is the next point? How will it benefit us in understanding what we're trying to do uh, from a clinical perspective? Uh, but it would be very important to study Indian classical music and its various forms and other things from both uh, basic science research as well as from the top down. That's the uh, clinical model. Yeah, so in here, I uh, thank, this is the music cognition lab at NIMHANS. We have uh, an EEG setup. Of course, we do have uh, fMRI and uh, mainly we do some behavioral studies and all that. And my collaborators and students without whom we, I cannot do so much of work. So thanks to Welcome Trust also, who have actually funded my idea to work with, especially with Parkinson's disease and you know, just starting that journey. Uh, maybe five years down the line, I may have some specific data on uh, rhythm-based intervention and its effect in Parkinson's disease. Yeah, thanks.